Our subject for this evening is AXA's asking. Oh, AXA's asking. And I'm just, I'm just happy that God has, God has given us the privilege to study about this very ignored character. The, her name is AXA. And one of the reasons why this is special is because this is a character that is only found probably in a few verses in scripture. And yet her life has a beautiful, beautiful message for all of us to learn. We've been having experiences of, of study with the Lord. We have been studying how God would like to remove all sin from our lives so that we draw into a meaningful relationship with him. We've been, we've been studying how God would like everything to be put away so that we quit playing with sin and we run to Jesus. The Lord's desire is that nothing comes between us and our Savior. And this evening, we want to go a step further. We studied, if you were with us last Friday evening, we studied about God's desire to fill us with his Holy Spirit. We studied how it is God's desire that during the week, we be pursuing Jesus. We be pursuing an infilling of God's spirit so that come Sabbath, we enter worship experience. We enter our communion experiences with one another and with the Lord, just packed with the Holy Spirit. And so this is one story that really lays a powerful foundation for us to prepare ourselves for that experience. Perhaps this is a character you probably may not have heard much about. And if some of you may have been interested, you would have quickly gone and looked and searched for Aksa in the Bible. And when you looked at her, you're probably wondering now, now there's just a few verses now. What, what, is, what is there for me to learn from Aksa? Uh, in fact, what's even more amazing is that Aksa's story is found in a very, very powerful book. It is the book of Judges. And, oh, it would, it would be such a blessing to, to journey together through the book of Judges. It, the book of Judges is a profound text, a profound text on a pivotal subject. The subject can be summed up in one word. The word is revival. The whole book of Judges can be summed up in one word. The word is revival. Through the book of Judges, God is trying to teach mankind, how God designs revivals, how God plans revivals, and what are the instruments, what are the weapons of revival that God uses to break down the strongholds of the enemy. Brothers and sisters, I really encourage you to study the book of Judges on your knees. Perhaps you're very familiar with characters like, like, like Samson, like Gideon, and and these are, are real well-known, real well-known characters in scripture. Truth is though, friends, that these characters cannot be fully appreciated. These characters just cannot be fully appreciated, out, appreciated outside of their context. These characters have to be closely examined for they come in a context. The context is, is, the, is the utter depravity, the, the utter spiritual destitution of Israel. And in such a troublous time, we receive these powerful figures of revival that are brought upon the scene, whether it's the story of Deborah, Barak, Ha'el, whether it is Samson and Gideon, whether it is, it is Jephthah. Uh, there are so many characters that come upon the scene. And it would really do us well to pay attention to these characters, for God indeed has a very, very special message to give us through these very, very potent stories. But in the midst of, I guess, all these big heroes, Aksa's name sort of just fades away. It sort of loses its essence. We think that, ah, it's just a few verses, no big story. We don't hear many sermons on Aksa's life. And so perhaps she's not so important. Perhaps she's not so important. I was reading a, a very famous preacher write about write about Aksa and and as I as I as I read through this message it was it was just beautiful it had it had a powerful message bringing across and yet as I looked at it, I'm like wait what how, how did 
like this person just wow just missed the the most powerful truth that Ox's story brought out and friends I'd like you to keep in mind the building blocks we are using, the springboard we're using to get into the story. And that is that it is the book of Judges. And the book of Judges is a series of revivals. And, and you'll notice in the book of Judges, there is a cycle of sin. There are a people who are living a life out there in the world, a life of sin. As a result, God allows them to go into captivity. When they go into captivity, they cry out for deliverance. God raises a deliverer. They come out of captivity and they go back to their old ways and the cycle repeats. They go back into captivity. They cry for deliverance. A deliverer is raised. They come out into freedom. They go back into their old ways. They go back into captivity. This cycle continues. Now, now perhaps you may look at the book and say, well, it, it, there's really nothing there because, I mean, all I see is Israel is failing and failing and failing. Probably someone says, well, I can relate to that. That's pretty much the story of my life. But friends, I'd like you to notice that these are not, these are not stories of failure. These are God's powerful, potent agencies of revival that God is bringing to the land. The problem the problem is not God's methods of revival. The problem is Israel's failure to respond to God's utmost potent, potent methods of revival. Brothers and sisters, I hope you realize that God's problem with us is not the method. Truth is many individuals look at big preachers, that they look at big names in the church and say, wow, so-and-so brother or sister, they're able to do such a marvelous work. I think they have a secret that they don't want to share. They have some secret going on that they would not like to share. I know they, they come up and they share these messages, but I, I think there is a secret they're not sharing with the rest of the world as to how they're able to grow. Truth is, friends, the methods are the same and the methods stay the same for everyone. Bible study works if you truly study the Bible. Prayer works if you truly wholeheartedly pray. Witnessing works if you truly, with every bit of strength in you, go out to witness for Jesus to a lost world. With those words, friends, I'd like to invite you to the beginning of the book of revival, the book of Judges. And friends, as you go through this, perhaps I, I hope you were not so new, but and, and yet if there's someone who's new here, let's let's go to First Corinthians chapter 10. It is the keystone we're using, and this really helps us appreciate the stories we're taking a look at. We're in First Corinthians 10, and I'm reading from verse 11. Paul is saying, All these things happened unto them for in samples, they are written for our admonition, for our warning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. If you were with us and you were paying attention to our previous discussions, we studied how in 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 through 4, Paul chronicles the experience of the children of Israel. And he, and he writes down a few of their experiences, uh, literal experiences like crossing the Red Sea and drinking water from the rock. But Paul says their literal physical experiences had deep spiritual lessons for us. Similarly, Paul tells us that in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10, that all these stories, they're really written as powerful lessons for God's people at the end of time. And so I'd like you to keep that in mind as we go through this study together. We're looking at the life of Aksa, and we want to know what is God's message for us at the end of time. What do just these few verses have to teach us about how revivals actually begin? How are revival fires kindled? And how, what does that have to do with the time that I am living in? Well, let's have those questions answered as we start off in Judges chapter 1 and verse 8. It's really beautiful. I mean, this character just gets lost in the giants of, of, this, of, 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 of this book. And we almost don't pay attention to this powerful character. Let's catch the story in, in Judges chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem. They had taken it, smitten it with the edge of the sword, set the city on fire. 
Verse 9 says, afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites that dwelt in the mountain in the south and in the valley. Verse 10 says that Judah went against the Canaanites that dwelt in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba. And they slew Sheshai and Ahiman and Talmai. Verse 11 tells us, from thence he went against the inhabitants of Debir. And the name of Debir before was Kirjath Sefer. Caleb said, he that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa my daughter to wife. Beautiful story. Caleb says, he that smiteth Kirjat Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. Now, you know the story too well. Caleb and Joshua were the only two spies out of the 12 spies that went to spy on Canaan that truly believed God's word. You see, friends, as the 12 men went to spy out on Canaan, when we were little, and, and I don't know if, you, if, if, if you're old enough to remember that song, uh, when we were little, we used to sing the song, 12 men went to spy on Canaan, 10 were bad and 2 were good. What did they see when they spy on Canaan? 10 were bad and 2 were good. Some saw giants great and tall. Some saw grapes in clusters fall. 10 were bad and 2 were good. I don't hear kids sing that song. I don't hear churches sing that song anymore. But it is a retelling of the account of the children of Israel. And while 10 of them came back saying, oh, we saw giants great and tall and the land eats up its people. There was Caleb and Joshua who says, God's word has said it. We should go ahead and take the land. And friends, they were almost ready to stone. They weren't really stone these brothers away because of, of what they were saying. They but these brothers were not looking at the obstacles in front. These brothers were looking upwards to the assurance God's word had given them that the land is yours. You are to go take the land. Similarly, friends, many people, many people like the 10 spies get discouraged. They get discouraged by the great giant, the devil who stands in front of them. The great giant who seems to block their way. And they say that I don't think I can make it. I don't think I'll be able to enter the promised land. Whereas Caleb and Joshua are reminding you, my brothers and sisters, that you are to take God for his word. Brothers and sisters, when you say, I cannot be an overcomer, you are calling God a liar. Again and again, God says to the seven churches, again and again, his message is repeated, reiterated, reverberated to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And to each church, he has this repetitive message. He says, he who overcomes, he who overcomes. Later on in the book of Revelation, he talks about Jesus himself who has overcome. Brothers and sisters, the way to overcome is by fixing your eyes on Jesus. Jesus, the overcomer is the key to an overcoming in your life. It is a beautiful story. It is a beautiful story. Jude 24, Jesus assures us. He says that I am able to keep you from falling. Dear friends, the encouragement that comes to us from Caleb's life is that God is able to give us victory. God is able to give us victory. Believing in that word, here is Caleb. Here is Caleb marching onwards, taking God at his word, not looking at his weakness, but looking at God's strength, not looking at his shortcomings, but looking at the soon coming of the great Savior. Caleb said, Caleb said, he that smiteth Kirjat Sefer and takes it. You know, they were, they were gaining this conquest over the land of Canaan. He says, he who smites Kirjat Sefer takes it to him. Will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife? Aksa, my daughter, to wife. We're introduced to that beautiful, beautiful character, Aksa, in this story. Oh, sister has a lot to teach us. Judges chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible says, And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. The Bible says Othniel, the son of Kenaz. Othniel is, by the way, one of the, one of the judges who's brought on, one of the deliverers who was brought on onto the scene. And then I believe you, 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 need, to, you need to visit Othniel's story as well. Oh, it is. These are action figures in the book of Judges. And the Bible says Othniel, the son of Kenaz, he took Kirjat Sefer. And so Caleb gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. Now, friends, we... We read, 
we read of the conquest and we read that Caleb keeps his promise and we read that Aksa is given as wife to Othniel. We pick up the story in Judges 1.14 and the Bible says, and it came to pass, catch the story now, it says, and it came to pass when she came to him, when Aksa came to Othniel, she moved him to ask of her father a field. Hmm. Friends, the Bible says in Judges 1 and verse 14 that when Aksa met her husband, when Aksa met, met Othniel, that she moved him. If you, if you read the word in the, in the Hebrew, she provoked him. She persuaded him. She stirred him on. She moved him. And, and, and she said that she said, we need to come to our father and ask for a field. Oh, this, is, this is a real, real rich story, brothers and sisters. The Bible says, Aksa, the moment she was married, she is encouraging her husband, let us come together to our father and speak to him. Let us ask of him. We're talking about Aksa's asking. We're talking, my brothers and sisters, tonight about Aksa's asking. Truth is, friends, that Aksa is such a role model. This woman of God, filled with God's spirit, has a beautiful message to teach all of us from Holy Writ. The moment she is married, she knows her responsibility. She is not usurping authority. Rather, she is encouraging. She is moving upon her, her husband saying, let us come to the father and ask of our father a field. Let us come together and ask of our father a field. Friends, I can't help but notice that here is a wife that is encouraging her husband to come and seek the father in prayer. You see, friends, in Aksa's asking is really a pattern for God's people. We're also going to notice that Aksa is desirous to speak to her father. Aksa has this boldness in approaching her father. And the question I'd like to ask, brothers and sisters, is that do we still share that boldness? Even though the book of Hebrews says we should approach his throne with boldness, not because we are able, not because we're righteous, not because we have any merit of our own, but simply because God has commanded us to come boldly. Isn't it strange, friends, that when we're little, no matter what happens, the minutest things, the, the biggest things, we, we take all that we have, whatever we move, whether we may have done right or wrong, we quickly run to our Father and with joy, with passion, share with the Father what, what, what we're going through. But it's so strange that as we age with time, we seek to hide things. We seek to sort of downplay things. We seek to put away, put things aside and never bring it up for discussion. And it's strange that we do the same with our Heavenly Father. Friends, the truth is, Aksa's story sets the stage for how revival fires are truly kindled. We've been talking about in these past few days that, that we're living in this anti-typical day of atonement. We're living in this time of judgment. It is a time when Israel was humbling themselves. We studied yesterday how there was, a, there was a man and a woman who were cut off because they were not humbling themselves before the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, the appeal from Aksa's story is that we should encourage one another to come and speak to our Father. It is my appeal tonight to a dear wife, to my sister, my sisters, my Aksa's sisters out there who need to encourage their husbands. They don't need to, they are not supposed to usurp their, the spiritual authority of the husband, but rather they are to encourage their husbands. Dear one, come, let us join together and speak to our father. It is my appeal to my Othniel brothers out there. It is my appeal to the Othniel husbands out there that they need to encourage their wives, their children to come and seek the Lord together, to come and ask of the Father together. What a beautiful story, friends. What a beautiful story. 
But I find as we continue in verse 14, this story just keeps getting richer. It came to pass. She's stirring her husband. Please come, let us go talk to our father. What a zeal she has to speak to the father. But then we're told something else. This is, this is mighty. We're told that as she got to her father, as she was approaching her father, the, the, last, the last end, the second half of Judges 1.14, says that she lighted from off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wilt thou? Friends, catch the story. The Bible says when she approached her father, she got off the donkey. When she approached the father and she saw that she is in her father's presence, she got off the donkey. Caleb asks her, what wilt thou? And then she presents her request. Again, friends, this is not an ordinary story. This is not a story you are just supposed to pass by. This is a story you're really supposed to pay attention to. For in Axa's approaching her father, are you and I taught how we should be approaching our heavenly father? I hope, friends, you're really catching the story. In Aksa's approach, not only is she a child zealous to speak to her father, she is also a child who knows how to approach her heavenly father. Friends, I want to present to you through the life of Aksa, what should be our manner in which we approach our heavenly father? For the Bible tells us that when Aksa approached her father, she got off her donkey. She had enough respect for her heavenly father that she got off her donkey to converse with her father, to listen to the question of the father and present a powerful plea before the father. Dear friends, my question this evening is, how many of you come off the donkey when you come approaching your heavenly father? Ah, friends, the truth is many of us do not want to come off the donkey. We get up in the morning, we're off rushing to work. So we take a few moments. Oh, Lord, I'm too busy riding my donkey. So be with me, guide me and protect my family. By the way, thank you, Jesus. And we run off. We're too busy. We're too busy, friends. God is saying, get off your donkey and on your knees. Dear brothers and sisters, do we even know how to respect the presence of our Heavenly Father? When will we get off of our donkeys to spend intimate moments with our Savior? Friends, the reality is there's a, there's a dear wife so caught up in the business of the, of, 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 the how, of, the, of the work in the house, so caught up that she's busy riding the donkey of, of, of chores in the house. She's busy riding that donkey. And she thinks that this is the way to truly bring up my home when she forgets that she needs wisdom from the Lord on how to be a blessing to her home. Oh, there is, a, there is a father who is to be the spiritual priest in the family, who is to be the guiding hand in the family, who is to be the one who has to make sure every individual is covered with Jesus. And yet he is too busy riding the work horse donkey. He is too busy quickening out, rushing out, thinking that by bringing the paycheck at the end of the month, I am fulfilling my duties, brothers and sisters. I'm sorry, the reality is, Anybody with two hands and two feet can bring a paycheck home. What God is looking for is looking for truly spiritual men and women. Men and women who bring more than a paycheck. They bring the presence of God. They invite the presence of God. They plead for the presence of God in their homes. Friends, I appeal to you this evening, get off of your donkey. Get off of your donkey. Get off of that donkey, friends, and spend quality time in the presence of the lord in the presence of the lord the devil is the devil is a wicked genius what he has done is that even though even though the lockdown has has, has thrown many people off of their horses the devil while people sit on their couches he's given them the horse of netflix and the horse of, 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 of Amazon prime time. He has given them all kinds of donkeys to ride on just so that they have no time to speak to their heavenly father. It's amazing that as, as the daughter in respect jumps off the donkey, humbles herself and approaches the father, the father as, as parents are so well at doing, the father can see, the father can read, 
The father can read the mind of the daughter and he, before the daughter could ask, he asks the question, what wilt thou? What wilt thou? Just tell me, what is it that you would like to have? Just, just say it out, daughter. What wilt thou? Just tell me, what is it that I could do for you? I'm reminded of a passage further on, fast forwarding into the New Testament. Jesus asked a similar question, although, although, although this time he was really the one offering something really powerful, but a similar language. I find an act in John chapter five, the man who's been crippled for 38 years. He's not been able to move for 38 years. There he is by the pool of Bethesda. And as he lies by that pool, Jesus comes to him in John 5 and verse 6. And the Bible says, when Jesus saw him lie, knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he says unto him, wilt thou be made whole? What wilt thou? Is the question of Caleb. Jesus's question is, wilt thou be made whole? What wilt thou? Do you know? Do you know what you really want? I've opened the portals of heaven. The riches of heaven are open for your blessing. They're, they're, they're open for, for your abundance. The, the Bible tells us that he wants to give us according to the riches of his mercies. He will supply our needs, the Bible says. And heaven's portals are open to us. But friends, the question is, when our heavenly father asks us the question, what wilt thou? What wilt thou? What, do you, what is it that you would want? Many of us rush to saying, I think I need, I need you to raise my salary. Now, I think I just need to get married. Lord, I think you really need to give me a bigger house or perhaps, Lord, a better car. Or, or perhaps you need to kick out my boss. He's unkind to me and give us a new boss. Or perhaps rather even better, make me boss of the company. Do you know what to ask? Do you know what to ask, friends? As we come humbling ourselves, as we come afflicting our souls, do we know what to present before the Father? What wilt thou? Jesus says, I have a plan. He says, I offer you wholeness. Wilt thou be made whole? Pastor Henry Wright expounds on this beautiful story and brings out that the Greek, that in the Greek, the words employed by Jesus are powerful. He says to the man who's been crippled for 38 years, he's not been able to move. He says to the crippled man, wilt thou be made? The, em the employment of the Greek word there is the same word that comes from the first book of the Bible, which is Genesis. And what Jesus is really saying, what Jesus is really saying to the man is that, do you want to have a Genesis in your life? Would you like a Genesis, my brother? Would you like to be recreated? Would you like to experience recreation, brother? And it's amazing. It is, it is, it is just amazing that here it is, here is Jesus. And Jesus is offering no ordinary thing. Jesus saw him lie. He knew that he had been in that condition for a long time. And he says, brother, do you want to be made? Genomai is the Greek word to be generated, to experience a genesis, to be assembled together, to be put together, to be finished, to be found, to be fulfilled, to grow, to be kept, to partake, to be ordained. God was asking him a deep, deep question. He was asking him, son, do you want a Genesis in your life? And he wasn't asking him, friends, notice the question. He wasn't asking him, do you want to walk again? That's not his question. He didn't ask him, do you want your limbs to move again? No, Jesus is asking for more. He's saying, do you want a new beginning? Do you want to be made whole? Not just your physical life fixed out, not just your mental life fixed out, not just your spiritual life sorted out, but do you want wholeness in your life? You know, friends, having come to this truth, it has transformed the way God has been teaching me how to pray for those people who are sick. It has transformed, it has, it has, it has brought a new definition and appreciation rather for me when I am to pray for the sick, for God is saying, you think that they're just physically ill, just like this individual, he's on the ground crippled for 38 years. If we say, let's pray for him, we'll all kneel down and say, Lord Jesus, make the person walk again. 
could Jesus have made the person to walk again? Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. And yet Jesus knew his need is deeper than just his limbs moving. His need is deeper than just getting up and walking again. So Jesus asks him, brother, I am asking you, do you want wholeness? Do you want wholeness? You'd be amazed at the man's response. The impotent man answered him and said, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another step at the down before me. Listen to me, my brothers and sisters. Jesus' question was, Son, do you want a new beginning? Do you want to be made whole? The man's response, Sir, I have nobody to throw me into the water. He says, Son, I don't think you heard my question. My question was, do you want to be made whole? Jesus is offering wholeness while this man is looking for somebody to throw him into the pool. Oh, friends, I really need you to listen to the story of the Bible real carefully. The gospel message and its appeal to you this morning is, this evening is that I want to give you wholeness. But perhaps somebody is still stuck. No, Lord, I just need to raise my salary. But son, I'm talking about wholeness. No, no, no. I think you just need to, 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 to fix my leg and make me walk again. But son, I'm offering wholeness. No, Lord, I think I just need a bigger house. If I have a bigger house, I think I'll be comfortable. Son, I don't think you're paying attention. I am talking about salvation. I'm talking about making you whole. I'm talking about giving you a new start. No, Lord, I think if I get married, everything will be in place. Brothers and sisters, when will we give God the right answer to the question? His question was, do you want to be made whole? Our response should be yes or no. But we're on a whole different subject while God is on a completely different subject. I don't know if you've noticed, though, the man is crippled, okay? Picture this in your head with me. The man is crippled. He's not been able to move for 38 years. He can't move his limbs. And what is he asking for? He's asking for someone to throw him into a pool of water. Mm, I, I, I don't think I had you there. Let, let, let me repeat it again, just, just, just in case I, I skipped over some of you. The man cannot move his limbs. He's paralyzed. 38 years. And what is he praying for? He's praying for somebody to throw him into a pool of water. Do you know what's going to happen? He can't move his limbs. When someone throws him into the pool of water, he will drown and die. He will drown and die. Jesus wasn't going to answer this prayer. Hence, we hear Jesus completely looking over the man's prayer and saying, son, just rise up and walk. Just rise up and walk. He didn't even go into a discussion. He didn't even explain to me. He said, he says, I'm not even getting into this prayer request. Rise up and walk. Because your prayer request was, I just need someone. I have no man. My question was, do you want wholeness? You were so caught up. You were so obsessed with the world. You were so obsessed in your narrow vision. You were so obsessed with what you thought was right for you that you completely overlooked the riches and the abundance that I was bestowing upon you. I'm talking about wholeness. You're saying, throw me into the pool. Son, do you know if I would have thrown you into the pool, you would have drowned to death. And hence, Jesus has, holds no discussions on his prayer. He simply goes ahead and does the impossible. He says, just rise, take up your bed and walk. The reason why Jesus did not answer that prayer, friends, the prayer to throw him into the pool, is because Jesus does not answer suicidal prayers. Jesus does not answer suicidal prayers. Somebody is vexed, frustrated. Somebody has given a prayer in Bible study. Why? Because, oh, I've been praying and Jesus does not answer. Oh, I've been talking to God and he's not been listening. I have asked him for this, but it's not been working out. Friends, perhaps you need to consider that Jesus will not, will not allow you to have that which he knows is going to take you away from him. Many times he will have to block the way and to keep you from having. Many times he'll have to intervene to keep you from getting your suicidal prayers answered. Rise. Don't you want to praise God tonight? That he looks beyond. He looks beyond our wretchedness and does for us what we did not even have the brain capacity to pray for. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Brothers and sisters, do you know what to ask of him? As you come to him tonight, do you know what to ask of him? What wilt thou is the question. Do you know what to ask? Do you really know what to ask? 
The Bible tells us in Judges chapter 1, verse 15, friends, what a beautiful story. The Bible tells us in Judges 1 and verse 15, it says, she said unto him, give me a blessing. Give me a blessing. Mm -hmm. Give me a blessing. Friends, Aksa knew what to ask for. She said, Father, bless me. Bless me. Notice the words of the prophet. The prophet speaks to us from that beautiful devotional book, Our High Calling. The prophet says, Christ leads us. He's talking about the time when Christ takes us up into the heavens at his second coming. She says, Christ leads us when we are caught up to meet him and enter through the pearly gates into the city of God. He leads us by the living waters. And all the time, all the time, he's educating and talking with us about things that he would have opened to our understanding upon the earth if we could have borne it. Friends, listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. When we get there, Jesus will reveal to us, child, I wanted to show you more. I wanted to help you understand more if only you were prepared to receive it. But child, the problem was, the prophet says, you did not walk fast enough. You took too many back steps. You took too many back steps. You did not walk forward. You did not consistently walk with me. Oh, how much more you could have understood. Oh, how much more you could have been victorious. Oh, how much more you could have grown in the truth. But child, you kept stepping back. You kept stepping back. The prophet says, we do not advance heaven word. We do not advance heavenward. Therefore, the light that would have come in glorious rays would not come to us because we were not prepared for it. We take a step back into the world to the gratifications of earth, and then we take a step toward heaven, and then we take a step back, and then we take a step toward heaven. Brothers and sisters, where, do, where are we expecting to go with this sort of a lifestyle? One step back and one step forward, today with the Lord and tomorrow with the world. Today with the Lord, tomorrow with the world. One preacher puts it so beautifully. One preacher puts it so beautifully. We are Jesus' bride, Sabbath morning. We are the devil's girlfriend during the six days of the week. We act like his bride on Sabbath, act like the devil's lover during the week. That's our life. One step back, one step toward heaven. One step back and again another step toward heaven. Friends, we're going nowhere like this. We're going nowhere like this. And my appeal to you, especially parents, is to fix that family altar, is to hold the hands of your children, your spouses, and invite everyone to grow in the Lord together. Friends, rebuke. Rebuke out anything that is keeping you. Spend time in the, at the feet of Jesus and ask him to put away anything that is keeping your family from growing in the Lord from growing in the Lord. Help one another rather than point out each other's flaws. Hold one another's hand and encourage one another to turn heavenwards and not earthly. Not earthly desires, not earthly pleasures. May the song of our heart like the songwriter be able to say, earthly pleasures vainly call me. I would be like Jesus. I would be like Jesus. What wilt thou? Give me a blessing, Dad. Give me a blessing. Notice, notice, oh friends, it just gets rich as we close. She said unto him, give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. Wait, 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 wait. Give me also springs of water. I don't know if you paid attention. Just, just rewind with me, rewind with me here. It's really beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. In Judges chapter 1, did you notice what Aksa had asked for? When she moved upon her husband, what did she say? Let us, let us just rewind here. Let me just take you back here. It's really important. Did you notice what she said to her husband when she moved him to speak to her father? Listen carefully. She says in verse 14, when she came to him, she moved him to say, let's go. Let's go and ask our father for a field. Mm. She says, let us go speak to our father. She urged him. She pressed upon him. She stirred him. She says, we need to go speak to our father. 
And when we go speak to a father, we're not going to ask him to give us a lot of money. We're not asking him to, to fill our homes with, with all the grocery supplies for the rest of our lives, to give us tons of servants who will serve us and take care of us. No, let us ask for a field, a field in which we are going to strive in, a field in which we are going to labor in. Dear brothers and sisters, the prophet tells us that there is one genuine cure for spiritual laziness. The prophet says there is one genuine cure for spiritual laziness. It is helping those who need your help. It is being there for those who need your help. It's to be out there in the mission field and striving and laboring in the mission field to help those who are in need of Jesus. Oh, dear friends, I invite you that you are to come with your wife. You are to come with your husband. You are to come with your children. You are to join hands around the marriage altar and say, dear father, give us the field. Give us a field to work in. Please show us the mission field you would like us to be a part of. Open the doors that we would see the field you would have us work in. But she doesn't stop there. You see, friends, Ox's story is so mighty. It gets gets really exciting. While she asks for the land, notice what she says in verse 15. She says, Dad, you give me a blessing. You know, I, I really need your blessing because I, as, as I work in this land, Dad, I need your help because you have given me a south land. I also, I also urge you to please give me springs of water. Oh, this is precious. Dad, while you've given me the mission field, the truth is the field will not work unless it has water. If I don't water the field, the field will not be able to grow grain for harvest. What is she talking about? What is the spiritual implication for the end of time? What does that water mean? For those of you who are not with us on, on Friday night, others have already caught on if you were with us there. Notice what the prophet says. Well, what John says, John 7, 37 to 39, we read, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. But this spake he, wait a minute, as Jesus said, If you believe on me, you will receive living water. If you believe, you'll have water. John says when Jesus spake of water, he was really speaking of the Spirit which they that believe on Jesus should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Wait a minute. So when we read in Judges 1.15, Acts is saying, Father, you've given me a field. I also need water. I also need water. And if water, as Jesus says, as John tells us, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, it says, Father, that now that I have a mission field, our mission fields will be fruitless. They will be empty. They will be without a harvest. They will be without any fruit to the glory of God if these fields are not wet with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. If they are not irrigated by the indwelling of the Spirit of God. If they are not permeated with the moisture of the Holy Spirit, if the hardness of the field is not softened by the winning, convicting, converting power of the Holy Spirit, dear Father, now that you've given us a mission field, should be somebody's prayer, should be somebody's prayer. Father, now that you've given me a mission field, perhaps the mission field is my neighbor. Perhaps the mission field is, is the individual down the street. Perhaps the mission field is the baker down the street from where I buy bread. Perhaps the mission field are the, are the very tenants to whom I pay rent. Perhaps the mission field are the people in my circle of influence. Lord, give us a mission field. But Lord, don't leave us in this mission field without the aid of the Holy Spirit. We need you to drench us, to bathe us in the springs of water. You know what? You know what's powerful? You know what's really powerful? Is that while she only asked for water, she has said, please give us springs of water. The Bible says the father, Judges 115, the father gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. <laughs> and this is where it gets special. She asked, Father, can I have springs of water? But the father gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. The father gave her and promised her the former rain and the latter rain. The upper springs 
and the nether springs. Child, you'll need the upper springs. And as you water the ground and the seed begins to germinate, it begins to take root, it begins to grow, you'll realize that the upper springs are not enough. Child, and when it's time for harvest, you will need the nether springs. You will need the extra portion of water. You will need the added moisture. You will need the added empowerment to bring the fruit to its fruition and prepare the plant for harvest. Child, you've asked for water. I'll make sure you receive both the former and the latter rain. You receive both the former and the latter rain. Aksa's asking. Aksa's asking. The truth is, friends, Aksa has set the stage for the rest of the book of Judges. This is how revival is experienced. Revival, as the prophet puts it, is an answer to prayer. Revivals only are kindled in an answer to prayer, a prayer for a mission field a prayer for empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and in the bathing of the former and the latter rain, brothers and sisters, you and I can go out and win the world. The mission field can be harvested for the kingdom of God. My invitation to you, young friend, my invitation to you, dear father, dear mother, husband, wife, my brother, my sister, my appeal to you is that you humble yourself tonight. Join hands with your family members. Go on your knees. Ask the Lord, Lord. Teach us. Teach us that when we come to you, we are coming to a father, not a dictator. Teach us that we're not just coming to the king of kings, but we're also coming to a loving, heartwarming father. A father who cares. A father who longs and yearns to listen to the heart cries of his children. A father who's just desperate to hear a word from his loved ones. Turn to him today, young friends. Turn to him, brothers and sisters. Ask him for that field. Ask him for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. The prophet tells us nothing, nothing but the baptism of the Holy Spirit will bring the church to its right position and prepare us for the soon approaching conflict. If it is your desire, friends, if it is truly your desire to humble yourself and to seek the Lord for the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the rich harvest to be produced for the kingdom of the Lord, kneel with me, please, as we seek the Lord together. Let us pray. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. What an honor it is to know that our Father cares enough. And while we may just ask for a few drops, He makes sure we are wet with the Holy Spirit. We are bathed in the Holy Spirit. We're immersed and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Dear Heavenly Father, please awaken us to the reality that there is a mission field to win for Jesus. Help us, O oh dear God, to quit asking for luxuries and to ask, truly ask, for a field to labor in. A field to labor in. Help us to ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. For while we're asking for all different kinds of blessings, the prophet tells us that when the Holy Spirit comes, he will bring every other blessing in his train. Father, help us. Help us to ask a right and not to ask amiss. Bless my brothers and sisters. Save their homes. Save their families. Save the young ones. Save some marriages that are about to break off. Save relationships that the devil is plaguing and destroying. Save your church, Lord. Prepare us. Anoint us with your spirit. Send us forth to gather a rich harvest for the coming of the Lord. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.